Hi guys, welcome back to the second episode of Spilled Theory. I wanted to thank everybody for the kind words and helpful feedback. I really appreciate it. Uh, Keep it coming. I'm happy and excited that we're up on Apple Podcasts as well as Pocket Casts, which is my favorite Android podcast platform. We're on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and you can go to anchor.fm slash spilled theory for more information. Last time was kind of a proof of concept, and so I hope this time is like cooking with a hot skillet. Today we're going to be talking about Center of the Universe, which is the second track on Built to Spill's album, Keep It Like a Secret. So I think I'll touch on a fundamental concept at the beginning, which some of the lessons we can learn from this song are based on. And if you already know this, just bear with me. You might think about it in a different way. We're going to talk about the major scale and how it works, and in center of the universe, there's a number of half steps that I think have a important role in the song. And so the half step is kind of the smallest building block of pitches. And so two half steps is a whole step. And with those two intervals, those two spaces between notes, you can build all the music. And the easiest to understand major scale is the C major scale, which is C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then back to C. There are no sharps and flats, and that's what makes it so easy. But something that beginners or people who haven't studied music might find it difficult to understand or realize is that the space between each of those notes is an equal. And so the space between E and F and the space between G and A is not the same. There's half steps between E and F and B and C. And so the effect that has on the scale, there's kind of more of a magnetic pull between B and C and E and F. And so the E sort of wants to lead to the F and vice versa. And the B wants to lead to the C so much so that people that study classical music call it the leading tone because it leads back to C. And so we start off center of the universe with a few of these half steps and it's really catchy. It has sort of a yearning feel. This time we're in the key of E major, which is E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C sharp, D sharp, and E. And we start with a little introduction, which is a little bit of a built to spill idiom. And that trademark is like a modest, short little pickup introduction that is the pickup notes to the downbeat on the next measure. Something that we see in a number of other songs, we see that in Big Dipper, we see that in Reasons, and we even saw that in The Plan. This time we're starting on the and of three and going and a four just before entering the song. This song is mostly composed of two main parts, the two riffs that we hear looping and leading into each other. One of those lines is the first introductory line. And then we have the line. And the half steps that we see in this pattern, the first one is the minor third to the major third, which is G to G sharp. And then we see half steps in the D sharp to E, which is the leading tone to the tonic. And we have that descending line, and that is, it's a steady eighth note pattern. It's kind of sing-song-like, or a little bit, a little bit like a kid's nursery rhyme. And that's something that I think is really unique to bands of this time. It's almost like they were making nursery rhymes for teenagers and adults, Pavement and Built to Spill. They have this catchy quality that is unique. And so then in the next line, this will be a little bit of a stretch to make, but I think it's an interesting comparison. This line, so it goes from the tonic to the minor third, to the major third, to the fifth. And so in one way, at least at a subconscious level, you're, you're literally going from sad to happy. And so I think that has a little bit of an effect. It's also an element that you see in a style of piano playing called boogie woogie and it's it's very similar to that i don't know at all if that was intentional but boogie woogie eventually led into rock and roll and it was a really danceable style of music and some of those lines uh, are found in both in the verse we use the chords e a and b And something that a lot of musicians 
recognize and notice the patterns in is how these chords are related. If we're in the key of E, that's the one chord. A, that's the four chord, because A is the fourth note of the E scale. And B is the five chord, the fifth note of the E scale. And so we can move those around into any key and have those same relationships. But what's important about these is that the one, the four, and the five are naturally major in the key of E. And so they're really strong chords. They are the root of so many famous and popular catchy songs like Louie Louie, like the Who's Underrated Can't Explain. Many songs use the one, the four, and the five. We hear a rich vocal harmony backing part during certain parts of the songs. We also hear a number of guitar overdubs. These are sometimes in the form of call and response sections to the main line. We hear the main riff played typically live on octaves by one guitar player, and then there's, there's the octave above that by another guitar player. And I would say that it comes down to the catchy riff the playing of the riff in three different octaves and the repetition of that that really builds on that really doubles down on the catchiness in this song in the pre-chorus we use the e chord the minor six chord which is c sharp minor we use the four we use the five chord b and the four chord a for this new section in the chorus we use the five chord to the minor six to the four, which is B major, C sharp minor, and A. Then they add the ooh harmony vocals for verse two, which further builds it up and drives it home for the last chorus. And before we talk about the lyrics to Center of the Universe, we could talk a little bit about some of the trivia behind it. We know thanks to bts.not23.com, which is a built to spill live chronology, that the very first recorded performance of it was on July 15th, 1997 at the Capitol Theater in Olympia, Washington. And later that same year, at the end of August, at the Bumbershoot Music Fest, they end the song using the riff that later becomes Aisle 13, and it ended up making its way into a new song on a much later album, which would be about 12 years later on the release of There Is No Enemy. I thought we could talk a little bit about the lyrics in this song. The lyrics of Built to Spill songs are tougher to pin down than the music is, and from what we've heard in interviews, they are even more unwilling to be pinned down. But we can talk about some of the ideas and thoughts that you may find and interpret in these, and feel free to comment the way that you see them, because this is all subjective. So we start with, I heard what I said to you, and it was so out of sync with the way I wanted to make myself out to seem. And so I think this part is about, it's expressing sort of a frustration with being misunderstood and not being able to express yourself in the way that you thought you had. The pre-chorus, I don't like this air, but that doesn't mean I'll stop breathing it. Who doesn't think they're at the center of the universe and being it? And so I think this part is about if you're unsatisfied with something that's essential, nobody really gives that up. They just kind of live through being dissatisfied with it. They probably won't take an action in it like we'll see later on. There's this interesting idea of everybody thinking they're at the center of the universe, and it's it's kind of a silly, human-centered way of thinking, but everybody is guilty of it. It kind of puts everything in perspective. The chorus, don't look now, just keep watching your TV, hating what's to see, waiting for someone to say something that's right. I think this is sort of about, it, it could be interpreted in, in a number of ways. In one way, it's it's kind of dissatisfaction with the consumerism of the 90s. I think it's 
about people being distracted by TV and entertainment and not doing things about what they're upset with. And the next line is, I heard what I said to you, thought it was all understood, but I wasn't getting through, I'd go on if I could. And I think, I think this line is just as relevant, if not more relevant today, uh, to the way that people are misunderstood. And as the ways of messaging each other have increased, there's, there's a way to message everybody through every single app that we have. It's so much more frustrating to get the true meaning across because now there's typos, there's autocorrects, there's tone of voice that we're missing. And even in person, some of those things are difficult to 100% get and understand. And so I think this element of the song I can really relate to as when you're trying to say something with a lot of meaning, it's frustrating when that meaning isn't transmitted losslessly. So that's a quick summary and overview of the lyrics. We'll take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll talk a little bit about lessons I learned in 2020 about songwriting and writing original music. I thought I could talk a little bit about songwriting and advice to people who are wanting to get into songwriting or people who have been struggling with it. Uh, It's something that I have aspired to do for a long time and didn't have the time or the focus to do it until the pandemic uh, forced that on everyone. And so a few things that I think are important for one is sort of a mindset of being playful and being okay with wandering a little bit. From what I've heard, a lot of songwriters don't necessarily have a set destination Today, I'm going to write a power rock ballad. Today, I am going to write yada, yada, yada. I think I think you just sit down and you come up with, you play around with an idea. You could start with an idea that you had before or that you liked and you change it enough to make it new and different, to make it, to put your own little stamp on it. It's important to record these ideas and it's important to record them as simply as possible. If you go through the process of learning the recording software and setting up a mic and finding the best mic and doing all that kind of stuff, you can you can kind of lose the inspiration and the original feeling that you had in the idea. So a lot of people will record a voice memo and save it for later. And then when you come back to it a few days, uh, maybe a week or so, you can have a better insight. You have a you have a better view on the on the quality of your work and maybe where it can lead to. And after that point, it's important to to nurture, to develop that idea and think about where it could go, how you can expand it. Maybe you could repeat it and change it a little bit the second time. That's something that you see a fair bit in Built to Spill music, a fair bit in Beatles music, a lot in popular music, period. Another important topic is the myth or misconception about inspiration. Sometimes inspiration really does hit you and you weren't expecting it, and you come up with something right there that you didn't think you could. But that's really rare, and most songwriters, most people who take it seriously, try to come up with, they have a schedule and they work on it every day, and they try to come up with something, maybe finish it that day. And so an inspiration for me early on in the pandemic was Irving Berlin. He was one of the most legendary American songwriters and he had limited music abilities. He couldn't play outside of one key and he worked every day on a song. And so I I think those are important lessons that you can use and learn from. And another important thing I think for creative work is deadlines because you can spend so long making little changes to something and never really be finished by it or maybe lose motivation. And so some tricks that I have found with that Sometimes when you involve other people, you feel more obligated to work on things and finish them and make them better. And so I like doing that. And another thing is deadlines. When you might be involved in a competition or you have a goal or something else is holding you to that deadline, that is very helpful. Somebody else that I look up to has said that creativity isn't necessarily like a well that you can run out of, but it's more like a like a plant that can bloom and grow, or like a muscle that you'd have to exercise and practice. And I also think of an Ira Glass quote that I'll paraphrase. 
And he says that you probably wanted to do something creative because you experienced something amazing that was creative. And it'll be frustrating when you start out because you don't know how to make that thing yet as well as the one that you liked. And so it takes a long process of finding out how to and practicing until what you make is closer to what you like. And it'll take some time. The same thing goes for practicing music as well. And if you can, reach out to somebody you know that writes songs. Uh, if you can't, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't improve your composing and songwriting ability. It's important not to make too many excuses. I am guilty of that, where I'll say, I don't have the time to practice. I don't know people that I can make music with. But there are ways in this day and age to find people to play with on the internet, and you can improve. Let me know if you have any questions. I will do my best to answer them. You can message me through anchor.fm, through any of the social media that I've posted this episode on. If you have any interesting trivia about any of the other songs, I would be interested in hearing it. And I've been thinking about future topics besides just songs that we could talk about. Could be gear, amps, pedals, guitars. As a musician, what to do when you're stuck writing a song, how to practice, and things that you can do to practice better rarities and collaborations and side projects and i'm gearing up for the next episode which is carry the zero it's going to be a big episode because that's a lot of people's favorite song i hope to do it justice so we're going to talk about the chords and how it's put together i'm looking into having a guest on to talk about their interpretation of the lyrics and i'm thinking we'll also look at soloing a recent development in the Built to Spill universe is they are re-releasing Doug's side project, the Boise Cover Band album on vinyl, CD, and digitally, and you can find that on their Bandcamp page. I remember the first time that I saw them, they were selling that, and it's a great collection of covers. I personally really liked the David Bowie song, Ashes to Ashes, I'm Glad, and introduced me to the Delusion song, Strange. If you liked the episode, be sure to tell your friends about it. Rate it on Apple Podcasts. That really helps it grow, and it helps get music theory to more people. We'll end this episode with a song by the band Figurines. The song is called Whatever You Found, and they sound quite a bit like both Built to Spill and Modest Mouse. This has been Spilled Theory. Thanks. But all